Hello! Welcome once again to Age of Wonders Planetfall. My name, as always, is Orange. This video is quite late. <laughs> um, I had hoped to make it in a week or two after my previous one. I think it's been more like six weeks. I haven't checked. Um, it's just It turns out global pandemics can do that. Uh, I've been lucky. I've been healthy. My family's been healthy. Don't worry about that. But uh, in my day job, uh, life's been pretty hectic. And I just haven't had the time or the focus uh, to make fun videos on the internet about games. So that's unfortunate, but life happens sometimes. Uh, however, I can make this video today, so I'm making it today. And I hope to be able to pop out another video or two in the near future. Um, I can't promise it, but I hope for it. So we'll see if that comes to pass. Um... With the mea culpa over, I can go into a couple more little um, preamble things here. Um, first off, uh, for anyone who hasn't watched the previous deep dive video on the Vanguard, uh, you don't have to do that. Um, the point, the point of these videos is that you can watch the parts you want to watch, and you can skip some of the other stuff you don't want to watch. Uh, I will, however, say that there is a five-minute discussion of just what the point of these deep dive videos is in that Vanguard video, um, which might be worth watching if, if you haven't watched any of the other stuff uh, that I put out on it. Um, otherwise, I am going to do my best to keep this video to be specific to assembly. I really don't want to make this be a direct comparison of, oh, this is how this, this is how assembly unit X compares to Vanguard unit Y. Um, that's not the point. So other than that discussion of just what the deep dives are, you can skip the rest of the Vanguard one if you have no interest in the Vanguard. Um, I will, however, make one exception to just quick talk about kind of my table of contents here, what I will address in this video. Um, that's the only thing I will be repeating from the, the Vanguard one. Um, first off, I talk about the themes of the race as I see them. Mostly, these are the mechanical themes, like how the actual pieces fit together, but uh, there's a little bit of flavor in there as well um, because the flavor leads into the mechanics and vice versa. So um, I talk about that for, for probably 10, 15 minutes, and then I go into what I perceive to be the strengths and the weaknesses of the race, um, kind of on the tactical level and the strategic, and the strategic level. Um, tilted towards the multiplayer side of things, and more specifically towards live simultaneous turn multiplayer because that's what I play. Um, I'm always up for discussion about it if anyone has comments, but usually I find that the differences in opinion come from a difference in game in uh, game settings. So many things carry over regardless of game settings, not everything, um, but it. I'm always up for, again, discussing about it, talking about it, um, to try to learn how different people play and, and what the repercussions of that are. Um, once I've talked about the strengths and weaknesses, I go into unit by unit, mod by mod, and then operations and doctrines. Um, I quickly talk about the secret tech variant units just to say what the difference is in the variant. Um, eventually, I, I hope to put out some secret tech specific videos where I can talk a little more on the repercussions of the variants in those. So that won't come in these videos. They're long enough as they are. Finally, I go through a couple example builds for the race, or multiplayer builds. Um, those builds are not supposed to be the meta build. They're not necessarily optimized builds. They may not even be builds that I personally have played as, although I've probably at least played against them. Um, really what they're meant to do is to showcase the tools that are available uh, to the race and then get into that discussion of, of okay, knowing what the strengths and weaknesses were of the race and having discussed about the different units and mods and all these tools that they have, how are we trying to fill the gaps or how are we trying to exploit the strengths and, and go through that sort of thought process um, to hopefully be useful um, for anybody that might want to play multiplayer um, and to just try to reinforce that type of thinking about the game um, as opposed to what, when you first start playing, just reacting and being very more proactive and thoughtful about what it is you're trying to do 
when you start up. Um, and then that's it. So again, it doesn't sound like much, but it it becomes quite a bit, um, which is great. I love it. I, I like making these videos, or I wouldn't do it. Um, so that's the table of contents. I will make one quick um, disclaimer here, specifically for the assembly, which is that I don't play as the assembly very often. Um, I play against the assembly quite a bit. Um, I have a lot over the various patches. Um, it just is... I don't have anything against the race. I find them fun to play against, certainly. Um, I just think the way or what it is they're trying to do is not... It doesn't really mesh with my personal play style. I just don't find it as enjoyable. Um, and then I just... That's why I just don't play as the assembly very much. Um, again, though, I played against them quite a bit. Um, in my little group of people that I tend to play with, um, we have an assembly main or two. So even though I don't always have first-hand experience as the assembly to answer these problems, I have second-hand experience from people that would know, and again, I, I know how they've played with these tools. So um, I do feel like I have the, the knowledge to be able to talk intelligently about them, but I did want to just put that out there as, nope, I haven't played as the assembly nearly as much as, as the other races, um, and that nothing to do with the assembly being bad or good or whatnot. Uh, it's just is that their play style isn't the one. It's not what I play. Um, but again, we'll go forward from there. Uh, I think that was it as far as kind of my beginning things. So let's go straight into the themes. Um, I'll start out by just pulling up the core unit here. And the obvious when you obvious tropes that come up when you see these guys is, you know, they're the bug, right? They're these cyborg group of individuals that some, maybe some hive mind um, that are taking, assimilating, observing into a collective. And I want to specify that the assembly are not the bug. And they are very, they're very much not these assim this assimilating wave. What the assembly are are recyclers. Um, they are they reuse things. Their goal is preservation, and they don't. Um, they're they're not going to be this mind controlling, and absorb into the group sort of of people. No, what they try to do is keep using what it is they already have and keep the thing and keep what they have going <laughs> as long as they can, right? If you actually go into like the story behind these guys, they were dying, abandoned on a planet, just trying to survive and they had to use whatever it was that was available and that's how they became cyborgs. It wasn't that they were some great hive mind. Um, if you actually go in, into the bits and pieces here, right, you know, they have an ability called Assimilate Show, but this ability is a heal, self heal. Um, it's not a mind control or domination or anything. Um, if you go into some of the other units, like, uh, let's alt tab, oh, alt tab here into um, the Reverse Engineer, they have a reassemble ability that revives a dead unit. They have mods that do similar things. Um, that's where they sit. Um, that's why they're cyborgs. To the, they were repurposing their bodies with mechanical bits to keep the bodies alive. That's That was their goal. Um, and I think being able to kind of leave aside that comparison with Star Trek um, is, uh, is an important one to be able to do to fully fully really utilize and understand what what is behind the assembly um similarly or relatedly maybe um on this kind of flavor level the assembly have a very unorthodox approach <laughs> to answering problems right um you know just just from the flavor side of oh we're going to just start grafting stuff into our bodies to to keep staying alive forever is not necessarily the first thing you would come up with. Um, 
that extends just mechanically kind of down the line. Um, it's most obvious, again, with, um, well, not again, but let's, looking at their defense, like the way that they approach survivability on the battlefield, I think is the simplest way to show an example. Um, they have, like, they have a healing mod where you destroy a corpse and heal yourself. Like, that's, that's a lot, I don't want to say it's a lot of hoops, but that's not the most direct way to stay alive, right? The most direct way would just be like regeneration mods, which was what the other races would have, but assembly don't run that way. Uh, they they take a slightly more complex path. It's probably more powerful um, ultimately, but um, that's only if it always works. Um, and they, sim like another example in the same vein is the reassembly module, right? Where, oh, we just don't care if the unit dies because if we won the fight, it just comes back for free. Um, that's a very un non-traditional way of, of thinking about how to use your unit. So that approach um, is something that you'll um, find in a couple different places, um, again, mechanically and thematically, uh, for the assembly. And that's important to keep in mind. Um, as far as just strictly <coughs> on the tactical side, um, kind of the, the theme and the approach that they have to fights, um, it's it's a lot simpler than some of the most story themes or the strategic level side. Tactically, their game plan is just put stuff in the front line you're willing to lose and then have stuff as far back as possible that's actually killing your opponent. Um, so, again, you've got units like the Scavenger, which is short range. Um, it's got some self-healing to be very sustainable. Um, but it's still a T1, you're still okay if it dies. Uh, you throw something like this in the front, and then you've got your Vopal Snipers in the back, which are a sniper range unit, uh, a lot of abilities, it's going to be kind of expensive, you're probably going to have it modded out. Um, it's a little squishy. These guys stay in the back, they're the ones dealing the damage, but because they're a little vulnerable, that's why you need this expendable front line to screen for them. Um, it's a simple game plan. Like, it's easy to describe. It can be hard to execute. Um, and, well, again, we'll discuss strengths and weaknesses later on, but uh, just as far as the base level of how you probably will approach most fights, that's really the assembly, um, is this frontliners that are going to be melee range or nearly melee range, and then a big step back before you get to the actual damage dealers that will hopefully be outranging whoever it is they're shooting at. Um, <coughs> going up a level from the tactical side to the strategic side, um, the assembly tend to have a very flexible choice in builds. Um, there's a cup, there's, at the very beginning of the game, there's a lot of things that they can attempt to do. Um, and that's largely because they have extra tech, which again we'll talk about in the strengths, but they have many options to start. However, once they decide on a path, they tend to be pretty locked into it. They don't have a lot of leeway um, once once they get going onto one. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm framing this as a theme, but some of that is just a consequence of the Vanguard or the uh, Assembly have a weak early game, so a lot of their early game tools just aren't that strong, and they need to get past it. But because of the way that the the tech trees are structured, um, if you uh, if your goal is to get out of the early game, there's no connections here. So whatever whichever one of these general paths you took, you're kind of locked, like you're stuck there because. If you start teching into your early things, you're not going to get helpful stuff. So, again, I'm saying it as a theme. I don't know if it was an intended one, but it's the way that the race tends to play out. They can be strong in a lot of different fashions, but you got to pick one and stick to it and hope that you're not countered because you just don't have a lot of possibility to back out of it and go with something else. Um... And relatedly, the assembly just in general playing to the late game. Again, 
I don't know if that's really, I mean, it's a developed theme of the race. I don't know if it was an intended one. It's just a consequence of they have a, a pretty weak early game. So by necessity, they're, they're playing later than you than many of the other races are, are trying to do. Um, oh, they have to play later than many of the other races have to do. Um, pretty much everyone else has at least an option of an, of an early rush, and the assembly just, they struggle to do it. It's not impossible, but it, it's, it's harder. Um, I think that's really it, I think, for the, those themes. Um, drilling down now into the strengths. Um, we'll go with the most obvious one first, which is that all the assembly are cyborgs. Well, actually, there's a couple things. The assembly have three basically unique tags for their race. One is that all assembly are cyborgs. Um, as far as this being a strength, you get a 10% resistance to all status effects. That's just a, a net boon, period. Um, I'll talk in weaknesses about it for a hot second, too, but that's a good buff uh, to always have this status effect resistance. Um, they have scavenged spare parts, which gives them some sustainability after combat, a little more so than anyone else would have. It doesn't always help them because they don't have the greatest, like, direct healing capability, depending on what units they're bringing, but, um, it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, and then finally, uh, they have a native arc resistance, which is not always going to come up, but when it does, it's helpful. So... Being a cyborg is a net strength for them, um, I think. Uh, there Again, there's a consequence to talk about in weaknesses, but um, overall, their, their racial tag package is good. Um, <coughs> moving up a level, um, the assembly have access to the firearms weapons tree. Um, again, without pulling too much from the Vanguard video, I talked a little bit there about how I feel va Firearms is either the best or the second best, um, weapons tech tree in the game. Um, it's just, it's very cheap, it's got good tactical operations, the mods are good, you get extra range very early. Um, not only that, for the assembly specifically, they have a, a unit or two that are quite effective at using the firearms mods. Um, it's just a very solid strength package for them. That being said, um, we have seen upcoming changes um, that will happen in the next patch. Um, they've been streamed. Uh, the arc tr or the uh, the weapons trees are going to be interconnected, and uh, I think they both start at tier one, two. I I don't have it in front of me, but um, Changes will be happening there, which is unfortunate because I had wanted these videos to be evergreen. But eventually, I'll have to update with the different uh, with the implications of the weapons trees. But for now, as of today, um, the tr the we the firearms tree is very strong, and it's a big part of um, or a big possible advantage uh, strength to push with the assembly. Um, as far as the more racial, um, mod lineup, um, really what you're getting from their, well, not just mods, but from the racial, um, military techs in general is you have a very interesting package of tools that are giving you an eff a massive effective health pool. And what I mean by that is... You're not necessarily getting a whole bunch of plus HP mods, or you're you're not getting a lot of like defensive stats. What you're getting is these kind of weird little oddball. Um, was the you get like uh, what I can't find the operation, but you're getting again mods that give you assimilation. You're getting mods that let you eat corpses. You're getting mods that let you um, regenerate out of combat, or, yeah, regenerate and then come back to life if you died after combat. So you're getting these kind of weird little utility tools, um, and you have scavenge, um, but you're getting all these little tools that are giving you a bunch of health um, in weird little different ways that just are really, without obviously 
buffing your your health or your defenses are really expanding your capability to take damage um, and still keep going. So um, it's the the entire pack, like any one individual one may or may not be good or bad, but the entire package is definitely a strength um, and it's one that it's not super obvious um, when you compare to how simple some of the other mods and stuff are for other races of, oh yeah, well this is obviously just giving you a bunch of health, that's great. Um, it's a little different for assembly, but uh, it can be very, very good and very nice for them in the right hands or the right build. Um, the assembly are a very long-ranged race. Uh, they have specifically the Vopal Sniper. Um, not everybody gets a sniper, but they also, again, tying into the firearms tree, Purple Snipers with Rail Accelerators gives them a pretty effective range boost early. Um, they also have uh, the Disassembler, which is not, I mean, it's not cheap, but it's not super expensive. It could be a Tier 8 tech, um, which gives them a, a very effective uh, long-range artillery. So they're not the longest-range unit or longest-ranged race in the game, but they're close to it. Um, and it's a net range is very strong um, in this game. So having access to long range units is a very, again, it's a strong buff for them. Um, on the strategic level, I will talk, to keep it at the high level, um, the assembly just have very good research and I will say that it is possible in longer games that they're eventually going to lose out on the research side um, because they don't have a lot of other good economic advantages aside from that. However, in the games that I play that tend to be pretty much called by turn 30 to 35 for one side or the other, um, there, aren't, there really isn't anyone at any other race that can super keep up with them um, on the tech side. If, if the assembly get anything like a decent start, um, they can pretty much tech into whatever they want to tech into before someone else could. Um, which is a very powerful strength um, that drives them. <laughs> um, and it's, it's the way that they're really going to be trying to win games. It still takes time, just because by default, you have to get to the tech, so even if you can do it quicker, you still are going to need to spend some amount of time. Um, and that's kind of why they they usually are playing more towards the later game. But uh, I don't want to downplay that that is a massive strength for them, to be able to consistently be out-teching everyone else, um, almost without trying. Um... Flipping to the weaknesses, uh, I had promised to talk again about cyborgs. The weakness with cyborg, um, it's not an obvious one, but uh, cyborgs can be targeted by pretty much every operation in the game. Um, by pretty much everything in the game. Usually, if you see something, it'll be limited. If it's limited, it'll say biological or cyborgs, or it might say mechanical or cyborgs, um, and that doesn't always come into play, but it does mean that sometimes where you would normally have, an, if with some other race, you'd have an easy fight um, against a unit or a marauder or something that would, would have trouble damaging you. Assembly don't get those freebies. They're always going to be targetable. Um, they're always going to be at least a little vulnerable. Um, it's not extremely punishing as a weakness, but it certainly exists, and it outweighs some of their um, other strength, the strength that they're getting from their, their racial tag package that I talked about. Um, and specifically for the cyborg thing, that's one that you wouldn't maybe notice um, as a newer player, but once you've played with them in multiplayer for a while, it it's one of those quiet little things that just builds over time of, man, why is this always a problem? And it's because you're a cyborg. Every unit on the roster is a cyborg, so everything is vulnerable to any op or attack. Um, oh, I shouldn't say vulnerable, but is targetable by any 
for, uh, any operation or attack. Um, the well, let me alt tab for this one. The assembly have exclusively armor for defense. Um, I had said I don't want to compare too much to Vanguard, but Vanguard are the other, well, Vanguard and Devour are the other races that have a similar weakness. Assembly have it really rough because they don't really even have any operation or anything to mitigate that. Um, they just strictly have armor and their mods and their units, um, period. So that particular vulnerability to side damage is one that you can only fix with secret text. Which, yeah, they have a couple mods that give raw HP, but uh, they come pretty late. I think they only have the one. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it can be rough if you're up against the wrong opponent. There's just not a lot of tools that you have unless you pick the right secret tech. And even then, um, it's it's usually the secret techs are more offensively oriented, whereas your racial stuff is what's giving you your defensive tools, and they just don't have an answer for for side damage. Um, it's a very it's a very low low for these guys. Um, I don't remember if I specifically addressed it yet, but uh, in general, the assembly have a weak mod lineup, especially in the early game. Um, like, of their first three mods here, <sighs> Ocular Implants gives a critical hit chance bonus, but if you dig into the math a little bit, that 10% critical chance is roughly something in the 5 to 7% damage range. Um, there's some variables at play, but it's, it's around that. And a mod that's plus 1 defense and 7% damage is just pretty trash. That's... That doesn't compare favorably with the other detector mods. Um, Flesh Terror is a melee... I mean, it's restricted to melee units. It's got a decent package of stuff to help you, but it's not super adding to your survivability um, before you can get into combat. And natively, the assembly have melee units at tier 1 and tier 3. Tier 1 melee units just aren't survivable enough. Um, to be modding up all that much, and tier 3 melee units just come too late. Um, and again, in general, a lot of the metas right now revolve around flying units, and melee are just not effective, obviously, against flyers. So, um, I don't, it, it just, it, it's a good mod on paper, but in practice, it doesn't help. Miniaturized Copes Processor is kind of similar, where it looks very cool. It's probably pretty good in single player. In multiplayer, it's just it's hard to give up an action to heal yourself at touch range. Um, and it's a active ability, so it's not inherited by summons. It, it's just it's a less effective than the sum of its parts, I think. Um, and it's it's not really giving assembly what it is that they they want or need. Cloaking implants is probably the first outright good mod, but it's a tier two mod, so it costs ten cosmite. It's restricted to light units. Um, if you compare it to mods at the same tier level, it's really not better than them. It's about as good as them, and having bad mods leading up to a mod that's as good as what everyone else is getting still basically means you got all the way to tier 4 to get one good mod whereas most of the other races have 2 to 3 maybe even 4 by that point um, it's it's just not helpful and it gets even worse when you look at their tier 5 techs and you have another melee mod and a single unit mod before you can finally just get to outright good things. <laughs> so their mod package is pretty trash right now. Um which is a shame because the assembly have like they're geared towards having a great modding capability and they just don't have anything to put in with that capability. Um I should have talked about this somewhere before this and the strengths of seen themes, but uh I'll quick Look, well, no, it's a weakness. I'll talk about it as a weakness. Um, let's look at the starting bonuses. Um, the 
assembly have two starting bonuses, which on paper look great. Um, they start with extra Cosmite, and they have no delay when they're applying mods to units. Uh, the issue with these strengths, or with these bonuses, is that neither one of them does anything for you right away. Um, you're probably not going to use either of those bonuses until turn 15 or 20, which is pretty slow. Uh, like many of the other bonuses, I mean, some of them you just start with a free unit from turn 1, so those are obviously <laughs> just excellent right away. Um, and the assembly just don't have that, which it combines with their, ba their bad mods, and it combines with... Um, a couple other things I'll talk about to just lead to being a really slow start for the assembly. Um, again, I had talked about they tend to play towards the late game, and that's more than a little bit due to necessity. They just don't have an opportunity for a great early game. Um, and overall, they're, well, again, we'll, we'll get to something in a bit, but... Um, that slow start can be very punishing. Uh, other things that contribute to that slow start, they tend to have weak clearing. Um, scavengers as a 2-1 melee unit are just generally vulnerable to weird AI decisions in auto combat. Um, they have, again, they have stuff like scavenge spur parts, but the unit has to survive before that can help you. Um, they don't have any again the bonuses aren't giving them any free units or anything to give them that extra kickstart. Um it's just overall the clearing isn't isn't great. Um the the units they start with just don't aren't handled as well as some of the other racial offerings. Um the final thing kind of contributing to this slow start. Um the inspector is a fine unit, and I'll talk about it in more detail later, but because of the way it's designed, it tends to lose all the scout versus scout fights. Um, it just doesn't have a lot of damage, even if it's got okay defensive stats now. It got it got buffed, but um, it will lose to most of the other racial scouts by default. Um, and for a race that already has a slow start, you really need to lean on your scouts to find easy things to clear and to look out for threats approaching you um, and to pick up all those little goody huts because uh, if because you really need them um, to help your economy aside from tech. And uh, just not being able to depend on your scouts largely being okay if you send them out into the wild makes things even more complicated and it slows them down even that little bit more. So it's a pretty significant suite of weaknesses for the assembly right now, unfortunately. Um just as kind of a general overall summary, um and the one place where I would willingly compare it to my previous video. Um the assembly are definitely weaker than the Vanguard, um, in most respects. Uh I think they're both equally difficult. Um, to handle, like, on a unit-by-unit -unit basis. Uh, assembly, uh, assembly might be a little bit easier just because their basic game plan is a pretty pretty simple one of send the melee stuff to the front and keep the snipers in the back, but um, they just don't have the tools to, to stay afloat early on um, to let them survive into the late game and, and win, um, not unless you're just very good at exploiting every possible advantage that you can um, to make it. So, of uh, like comparing the two directly, I put assembly below Vanguard. Um, as I continue to make videos, I'll probably still have this one little summary bit of where all the races compare, uh, and we'll see if that changes after after the patch. But um, I don't know. Ass Assembly's been at the bottom for for a while now, although it's gotten way better. Um, the T Rex gave him stuff. <laughs> it, it helped. Um, I don't think it helped quite enough, but the the best got worse and the worst got better, even if the relative positions didn't change. Um, so, having talked about the strengths and weaknesses, we can move on to the units. Um, again, I like to alt-tab for this, just because I think this is... Um, <coughs> the mod database just has a better layout to talk about them. And uh, I will, once again, 
talk about the units um, in tech order. So we start with the inspector as the scout. Um, as a scout, the inspector is fine. It's a flyer. It's got the same scout um, stat line or close to it. I think some of them are... There's actually quite a bit of variance in the scout stat line, but um, it got buffed to basically be on par with everyone else. What it doesn't have is a lot of damage. It's got 7 range attack, which is pretty good for scouts. I don't know if any of the others are 7 range off the top of my head, but um, 7 damage is a little low. It doesn't have air to air. So it just it doesn't shoot very hard, um, and its its other abilities aren't super great in combat in one v one. So you will die to other scouts, most of the other scouts, anyways. Um, the advantage the inspector does have, though, is that it's a lot more useful in kind of the mid game and even the late game um, to have one or two of these in a stack because it brings along a heal. Um, having a Okay, heal. It's not, I mean, it's not great. It's only 20 hit points and no status effect clear, but um, it's still on a unit that's dirt cheap and a flyer, so it's it's mobile and you can get it to your stacks without that much hassle. Um, usually, if you're out scouting anyways, you should have a scout or two close by your main stacks to be looking around for things, so it's pretty easy to pull them in and bring them along to a fight um, if you have an ep empty space or two. So... It's mixed with the inspector. I think it's a fine unit. Um, it's just uh, that scout versus scout thing, losing that doesn't help when you look at the whole package of what Assembly has um, and that weak early game. Uh, the tier 1 co-unit is the scavenger. Uh, the scavenger is... Well, I've, I've heard mixed things about it. Um... The assembly mains I play against like it. They think it's fine. Um, it's certainly not like the strongest core unit by any means, but for the role it fits, it fits very well um, as that kind of more expendable frontline chaff um, that you're okay when it dies, but it's relatively survivable, um, or maybe I should say cost-effectively survivable. Um, to to keep your actually damp your actual valuable stuff in the back um, alive as long as possible to keep dealing damage. Um, where I think some people struggle with it is that it's melee oriented, but not necessarily a melee unit. Um, the shotgun attack is actually pretty solid. Um, it's got a really high accuracy fall off, which is a stat that you don't see. Very often, you have to dig in a little bit before you can find it. Um, with that, I think the shotgun is only like after. So, let me back up. I will quickly talk about just what accuracy falloff is for anybody who doesn't know. Um, it's a, like I said, a relatively hidden stat where the maximum range of the shotgun attack is five, but your accuracy will start to drop before that five range. Um, I think for shotguns, it's only like one or two tiles where. Uh, your accuracy begins to drop. Um, for something like a sniper unit, I think it doesn't drop till seven tiles, and for seven range attacks, it's really six. I, I don't rem remember them all off the top of my head. It's not something I, I... I have friends that know that off the top of their head, so I don't have to. But um, for the shotgun specifically, that 90% accuracy is deceptive, and it really is more of a super short range attack. Um, having fought against scavengers a lot, Often the most effective use of a shotgun is to run somebody up into melee range, and then instead of claw slashing, you just shoot them. Um, because it's more damage, it gives you high impact, and then because you have a melee attack, you're still in melee overwatch. So that is really kind of the, the mode of the, the scavenger. of It doesn't necessarily need to be used as a melee unit, um, and it's often more powerful if you don't, if you use it as kind of a one to two range unit as opposed to strictly melee. Um, but it is, you will take losses with it just because it's a short range unit. Um, and your goal with the scav is to be able to mod it the least amount you can and use it as cleverly as you can so that your opponent can't strictly ignore it. Um, because if you aren't using it, like if you miss 
place it on the battlefield and the opponent can just not care that they're up, then they go kill your important things. So you need the scavs to be at least annoying enough that your opponent uses actions to kill them. So that something like your Vopal Sniper can do the killing. Um, the Vopal Sniper is an excellent unit. Up until a patch or two ago, um, it was single-handedly carrying the assembly. <laughs> um, it used to have, like, I don't know, 18 or 20 damage plus, like, 20 to 30 crit chance or something. It's been nerfed a couple times. Um, at this point, it's listed as a support, well, as a, what's the word, a specialist unit, i.e. a support unit. And it is. It is a support unit, but it's a very unorthodox support unit, again, <laughs> Unorthodox answers to problems being a theme of the race. Um, the way that this unit supports the general um, battlefield for the assembly is that it's a crowd control and a uh, debuff sort of unit. So um, it has concussive shot to shut something down, like hard stun it for a while. Blinding shot effectively makes things really, like, it really hurts your um, attack. And it's on the snapshot, so you can be blinding with impunity, pretty much. Um, and it's got massive impact on its um, sniper shot, where, if I recall correctly, the other snipers... Uh, let's look at the Guild Assassin. Um, are only high impact, so having massive impact, it's, it's way more consistently going to go off. Um, and it'll go off against... Um, many units that your opponent might have wanted it not to have, like, let me back up. If your opponent's like a melee build or something that's been putting stagger resist on everything, Vopal Shot is still going to stagger them, um, because many things that you can mod to be one level of stagger resistance, um, you really have trouble getting another level on, so it is u good utility. Um, the critical chance, 15%, again, like I said, that's a little higher. It's probably around a 10% damage boost when you average it out. So it's it's helpful. It's not bad. Um, it, re it really just means that that 16 damage is lower than what the effective damage is. Um, I think the Vopal does have a slightly lower damage output than the other snipers. Not a lot, but a little bit. Um, well, quite a bit less than the Guild Assassin, because Guild Assassin is just nuts. But um, where it comes back is because it has so many tools to be removing actions, or even whole turns from your opponent. Um, the Vopal Sniper is just way more utilitarian. Um, and you always would like to have a couple of these along to just shut down the targets, and you'd be shut down. Um, as a standard Sniper package, it has, a, it has Overwatch and a specialty Overwatch. Um, improved Overwatch, I don't think, is one of the, the good ones. Um, y often, I think, if you're Overwatching with a Vopal Sniper, you're probably, probably doing it wrong. Um, you most likely would rather have blinded something, or attempted to blind something, or have got a concussive shot off. Um, or even just a Vopal shot if you have full actions to burn. Um... Like I said, it used to be absolutely broken. I still think the Vopal Sniper is a top-tier unit. It's like A-class or S-class, um, but it's not at the level anymore to just hard carry the whole race. Um, it needs it needs help to, to win fights. It, it can't do it by itself. It at least needs scavengers in front, which it didn't used to. Um, the Electrocutioner is the... T2 default skirmisher unit, um, conversely to the Vopal Sniper, which has been nerfed a couple times. The Electrocutioner has been buffed a couple times. Um, it's still not quite there, but I personally think that's less to do with the unit and more to do with the support around it. Um, it's not a firearms unit. It's an arc unit, and the arc tree just doesn't have a lot of great support. Um, static buildup is okay, not great. Um, arc retaliation just doesn't help the electrocutioner at all, because 
you don't want anything to be within two hexes, so it's a all it gives you is plus one shield, which against psi units show, but that's largely a mod slot wasted. You really need to start getting to arc impact or further before you're getting helpful mods on your electrocutioners. And um the way that the unit is designed, which is that it's kind of it's pretty squishy. It's only got it's got more health but less defensive stats than units at the equivalent tier. Um, it it kind of wants a little more defense that that the assembly just can't really help it with. And if you start kidding this guy out, um, like if you go for mods that help the electrocutioner, you're probably not getting tools that help your scavengers. And you still are going to need scavs to screen for these guys. Um, on paper, this thing is great. It deals a ton of damage. Um, by having native electrify, just the 7, seven range, 11 repeating is pretty high. Um, there really aren't a lot of tier 2 repeating 7 range units. Um, it's just kind of a window that doesn't exist. Well, ground units. It's just kind of a window that doesn't exist, ironically. Uh, I don't know if it's ironically, but um, there's not a lot to compare it to. Um, it, it has this, you know, at will, seven range, effectively a grenade shot. Um, I like the unit. It looks great. Well, it looks at least good on paper. I don't know about great. But uh, when you look, when you try to make a build with it, it just it never quite comes together. Um, this is one where I, I, I'm i excited, I'm always excited for the new patch, but I'm, I'm doubly excited for the new patch because I think Assembly will really have, they'll really like those weapon tree changes that I talked about, that we've seen a little bit about um, on, on the streams. Um, having the arc tree be more accessible and being, like, it, having it be cheaper and being able to skip around arc retaliation and still be getting kind of rail accelerators and some of that those tools should really open up electrocutioners to be used. But right now, today, I don't really know of anyone that's s made an attempt uh, at an electrocutioner build work. Um, it just doesn't quite fit. Um, the reverse engineer is the first tech unit. Um, it's a tier two specialist. Um, it's been pretty drastically rethought in T-Rex. Um, it used to be able to essentially go infinite. Um, it had an ability to eat a copse and reset all of its cooldowns. Um, I talked a bit about that, I think, on my video on the T-Rex patch, but I always felt that that was a ability that was too good in single player and useless in multiplayer. Um, just because people would never let you get away with that in, in an actual multiplayer fight. So in um, with this rebuild, I think the reverse engineer, it's certainly better um, than it used to be. Um, it, uh, it's really tanky for a support unit. Uh, 50 hit points and two defensive stats puts it, I think, better than anything except the Arborian Sentinel as far as defense goes. Um, so it can, you know, it can bang a little bit up in the front lines, which is what it's intended to do. Uh, create construct is just flexible, um, even though the construct itself, we can look at it down here, I think. Um, construct. Basic. Even though it's, you know, it's just 20 hit points, it's not going to take much damage. Um, it's still another unit adding actions f for you on the battlefield. Um, it's something that's easy for your, well, your opponent either has to dedicate actions to kill it, or he's going to take extra damage if he doesn't. Um, being able to just summon at will is helpful. I think that's powerful. Reassemble is obviously, well, I shouldn't say that. Reassemble is okay. It's less good than you might imagine, um, because it's touch range. So... <sighs> Whatever that has died is probably going to be more of your frontline unit. Generally, for the assembly, as I said, your frontline those tend to be the more expendable ones, anyways. Um, if you have a voice engineers in your frontline, they're going to be a higher priority target than your scavengers are going to be, likely. 
I really think Reassemble is better just as the 35 heal. Um, 35 heal going into defense mode is not that bad. Um, just by itself. Again, though, the engineer is going to be the primary uh, primary target, I think. So, yeah. It's, it's not bad. Like, it's not outright bad. I just don't know if the reverse engineer quite is there yet. Because um, damage-wise, it's got Elk Blaster, which is a shotgun attack without high impact. Not very good. It's got a melee attack as its other one, which... 11 damage is actually pretty low for a tier 2 melee, if I recall. I mean, compared to, like, let's say the, uh... Well, let's look at the Lancer. Um, it's lower than the Lancer's base damage, and doubly low when you consider some of the other abilities that Lancer has. So, yeah, it's got a pretty weak melee attack for a tier 2. Um, really, for this guy, you're bringing it because you want to be able to create constructs and have another extra heal along. Um, which... The reason I don't think I see a lot of these, well, aside from just not seeing a lot of, a, well, assembly in general, is because you have to tech into it, and the unit itself is not good enough to be worth teching into um, as, like, a core of a build. Um, and if you look at their tech tree, well, the next unit you tech into is Lightning Rider, which we'll talk about the Lightning Rider in a hot second, but you're not going to be building reverse engineers if you're building a bunch of lightning riders and then after that you're going all the way down to records and it, yeah it just it doesn't really fit in any build paths for them i i do think the unit is like if somehow you get a couple of them i think you'll probably be happy to have them i just don't think that you're going to want to go through the effort to build them um but i could be proven wrong um and some of this i still think I think is just colored by the fact that the assembly's early game is so bad that you really have that when I am playing against them, um, you have to have a the people I play against have settled on a couple of really kind of specific pathways um, because that's the most viable way that they can come up with to consistently get through that early game. Um, after the Reverse Engineer, like I said, comes the Lightning Rider. Um, Lightning Rider is another unusual unit. Um, there's quite a few of those in the assembly lineup. Uh, it is a flyer. Flyers are a weird mix. Any of the flyers that are independently good, and by that I mean the flyers that are just like a decent combat unit by itself, you can get six of them and be good. Um... All of those are borderline overpowered. Um, the ones, if you get something like a ramjet, is around the balance level where it's independently almost good, um, but still vulnerable, and it's it's hard to consistently clear with it like that. That's around the balance level. The lightning light is in a weird spot because it's actively bad. The more of these you have. <laughs> um, because Elk Strike hits your own units. Now, the Lightning Rider can deal a lot of damage for an air unit. Like, a lot of damage if you Elk Charge into Elk Strike. But, uh... Flying units just lose so much utility when you aren't willing to have a stack of them on their own. So much, like, they're des designed around the capability of being able to be really mobile on the strategic map. And Lightning Riders just can't do that because you can't comfortably six stack with them. So the Lightning Rider is almost certainly the weakest of the flyers um, just because it's got kind of that anti-synergy of being a flying unit that can't just be a flying unit by itself. Now... I think there's probably some interesting utility that you can use Lightning Riders as a uh, as a hero uh, vehicle. Well, vehicle for assembly, but um, that's in very interesting, and there's probably a way to really break that. But I just don't think that's really there right now. Um, I don't. I don't know if the unit. 
like I, I saying it's bad, but some of that is just the design of it, and not so much that any of the stats are bad. And some of it too is still just that the oak tree isn't helpful for assembly. Um, their only other early oak unit that's actually like an oak unit is um, the electrocutioner. The reverse engineer has an arc attack, but that's not really how you're going to be using it. So, if you're going into arc, I guess you could put arc retaliation on this guy. But you don't want static charge, because you're not doing a... T like, your arc strike alpha is what you really are going for. So, if you're going with an alpha strike, the static buildup isn't super helpful. Um, arc retaliation might be okay to kind of help you stay alive once you charge in, but arc impact is only going to take you from high impact to massive impact, which is situationally okay, but not always helpful. Otherwise, you're looking all the way to stun module and arc extension, which both are phenomenal mods, but that's a long way to go for a unit that you needed to not, not just tech into, but get three techs to get, so... Even for assembly, that's that's a lot of a lot of dedication. I just don't see it. Um, again, things might change with the weapons tree rework. That's upcoming. But right now, the lightning rider just doesn't fit in anything that the assembly wants to do. Um, which again, it's a shame because it's an amazing design, um, and and I'd love to try to make it work because not like visual design it's amazing but even the unit design is very unique and cool and I'd like to try to make it work or see it be made work and I just don't think you can do that right now um, skipping the navy units again um, as before we go to the wrecker um, the wrecker there's an archetype of this tier 3 melee unit that a couple races have you very rarely see them um, just because you very rarely see elite units to begin with. People tend to steer away from melee as well, so a melee elite unit is very hard to see. However, if you do get the wrecker, and if it's in a situation that it's useful, right, where you're fighting somebody that's not just doing a flying meta, boy, can this unit screw with people. <laughs> like, it can really destroy things. Um, 65 HP and 5 defensive stats is massive. Plus, it self-revives once per battle. Um, it's slightly weaker, but it's still a lot more effective HP. Um, hammer Strike is a ton of damage. 15 repeating massive impact. So, not only are you going to be clonking people for probably... 30 to 45 damage, but um, you're going to be removing an action, and like almost certainly removing an action in the meantime, bypassing shields, um, which is strong because the prevalence of Psy means that people like to uh, like to focus on shields over um, armor. Wild Swing is interesting. Um, hammer Strike is um almost always better but there's situation use for wild swing really it's just man can this guy hit hard and wild swing still lets you do slightly more damage um oh it's no cooldown that's right record's been changed a couple ways i forgot how but because it's no cooldown as well it just means that if you have a single action to use it's always better to do this which is cool um Hyper armor defense mode, even more tanky. Yeah, this is the wrecker. He's he's a brick house. Um, in any situation that he's useful, he's extremely useful. It's just a question of getting there, which uh, again that that can be hard to do. Um, as as with a couple of the other assembly units, as I've already said, I I love the idea of the wrecker. I just the assembly has a hard time affording some of these kind of these cool niche builds because they just struggle so hard. Um, and building toads in an elite unit is is difficult to do if you don't have like any tools to keep you alive early on. And those tools to keep you alive are basically going to be the scav and the vocal. So 
the stuff you're attacking into for that isn't super helpful to the wrecker. I guess you could put some of the um, melee mods on it, but you're probably not getting those anyways, because you don't want to mod scabs like that. Um, I have actually seen the disassembler in fights. I've had to fight against it. It's nuts. Um, it... So the 13 damage at 7 range, repeating attack, high impact, is very crazy. But um, disassembler shots even crazier. 15 damage persistent um, is a lot. And if, like this unit, the disassembler, it's less helpful against melee. Um, it, it can be helpful, but it depends on your maps. Out. Where the disassembler really shines is against players that want to be doing a uh, kind of standoff engagement because it disassemble basically means you can't stand behind cover ever again because <laughs> it leaves this giant cloud that just will destroy you if you try to sit in it um, it just takes a long time to get there it's the second level of the tier 3 right it's um way down here so you have to the penultimate unit. Um, cumbersome doesn't matter so much. Again, I it's one of the stronger artillery units, I think, if not the strongest, because um, again, it's a firearms unit. You can give it even more range. Um, you can give it uh, some of the very cheap utilitarian um, firearms things like ammunition flechette or electrified. If you really want to go crazy, you can put kinetic phase modulator on it. Um, I think there's some crazy interactions with Firebolt as well, but point being, um, it's probably the best artillery unit. You're still really going to see artillery units in real games. If anyone was going to try to pull it out, it'd be assembly, though. Um, they have the tech tools to get there. If they survive, the disassembler is a very powerful target to, to try to aim for to win games. Um, I've, I've had it attempted against me. I don't trying to remember how that game worked out. I don't think it quite worked, but it was scary because, um, again, it's also a vehicle, so you can just mod heroes with it, which means that once you get to disassemblers, if you have heroes able to use advanced vehicles high, that have a high enough level, you can skip worrying about building elite barracks or having to actually build the units. You can just immediately put them on your hero. Um, and a hero disassembler is nutty. So, this is a threat. Again, continuing with the vein that I've been talking about for the past half hour, probably. Um, it's just not something you're going to see very often because assembly can't get there. Um, it's just too hard for them to, to manage it, I think. Um, the Reaver slash Swarm is their tier 4 unit. Um, I don't know. I, I've never fought against one of these um, controlled by a, a person. I'm trying to think. It is relatively common um, in some of the landmarks, but uh, I don't clear landmarks as much as some other players, so I really haven't fought against this all that often. Um, I don't remember if or how it would have been changed in T-Rex. I think it was not, but I could be wrong about that. Um, it's probably really fine. All the, t all the T-4s, I think, have niche use if you would ever get to them. Um, repeating arc. Oh, it heals when it switches foam. That's cool. So it's got like infinite healing. Um, can instantly turn a unit into a construct. That's pretty good. Yeah, it seems like an extremely scary unit, but uh, it's a tier four, so I won't talk about it any more than I have to. Um, I looked. I had talked about the construct before. This is the summon from the reverse engineer. Um, the advanced construct. <coughs> is the modded version of the construct um, from Advanced Engineer, uh, as in modded by which I mean that uh, Advanced Engineering is the mod you need to do it. <coughs> um, it is an upgrade, obviously. 
uh, still not really worth talking about. Uh, the constrictor is a summon, and I will talk about it as a summon when we talk about operations. Nothing special about the colonizer, and their turret is the arc coil, which applies static charge natively. Um, probably one of the weaker uh, turret variants. Each race has a unique one. Um, static charge is not a super powerful debuff. Um, depends on what militia you have. You will most likely not be using a lot of arc units um, in your actual army, so you're not going to be getting a ton of value out of landing static charge. Especially again, especially on a turret which you can't control the uh, you can't control the target, so you can't prioritize something you really want to kill and then focus it down. It's going to be whatever the turret happens to attack. Um, so that's it for the units. Let's go back into the mods. Um, and again, I've talked about them a little, at a little more higher level, but specifically, um, at that high level, again, they're not super good, but uh, ocular implants is, it's cheap. You get it very early. It is probably slightly below power. Um, as far as your cheap early effective mods go, basically ocular implants reads as plus one armor and generously plus ten percent damage. But plus one armor and plus ten percent damage is not all that great, even if that's what it actually was. It's worse than that because it's critical chance. So you will end up putting this on stuff, but that's mostly because um, you don't have anything else to put on. Um, and it's okay now that T-Rex changes so that you don't lose Cosmite, um, and because of the way the assembly mod package works, you can do it instantly. You'll just be throwing ocular implants on stuff if you have it with the intention of replacing it with a better mod later. So um, you will see it. You will probably have to use it. You'll wish you had something a little more effective. Uh, Flesh Terror is great on paper. Um, it's just a general overall boost to melee in all kinds. You get more sustainability. Applying bleeding is fine. Um, and it, because all of the assembly melee attacks are physical damage channel, um, it's, it's not only is it doing direct damage, but you're also um, getting more of, you, you're dealing more damage to the target as well with your other attacks. Um, problem is it's a melee limited only mod so and it's it's the heal or the assimilation for four hit points is um helpful but i do think this mod would be better if instead it was 10 percent more damage it was a, a raw defense mod um i just think that really you really need more defense on melee units as opposed to more offense um and flesh terror, the the healing is not quite enough um, to to make this into really be a defensive mod. It's still a little bit too offensively oriented, so um, it's not quite there for me. Some of that too is just the races that have a tier one and a tier three melee unit, as opposed to a tier two melee unit, just have trouble. The tier ones are a little too squishy. Um, to mod up and put in the front line. The tier threes are a little too expensive to get to. So they they just get left in this kind of window of mm, you don't use their melee units. Um, and I say this as someone who uses melee units way more than a lot of the OS of the community does. Um, you really want that sweet spot of T2s that are tanky enough to live um, and, and be worth modding and also be reasonable to, to each. Metricalized yeah, miniaturized Copes processor is a brand new mod um, added in T-Rex. Uh, it definitely fills a gap. Um, it's a strong defense option on paper. Um, I had discussed earlier that I think it's a little bit less than the sum of its parts. Um, again, on paper, it's like, oh man, plus two armor, and you'd be able to get strong healing. Um, yeah, once per battle, um, that only requires you to have killed an a enemy. In practice, it just it doesn't really work that way. 
Um, it's how to find the unit you want to put this on. Nominally, you'd want it on something like scavengers, but uh, like I said, you're not going to want to be putting too many mods on your scavs. And you're continuing to just stack armor, which is a risky proposition. So, Miniaturized Cope's processor just doesn't quite have the utility that you might want it to have in order to carry the race. Um, cloaking Implants is a solid mod. Um, it oddly makes the assembly a uh, stealth race, because <laughs> Tier 4 is kind of slow to get, but not so bad, and especially for assembly. So in principle, you can have quite a few things modded and invisible wandering on the map. Um, probably more so than anybody but um, Syndicate, obviously, although I think uh, Amazon could get close. But um, again, it's a l slightly slow to get to. It's light units only, so well, it doesn't limit you too bad. Um, and the stat line is just fine. Uh, really, it's for when it comes out, it's the same impact. It's around the same impact as equivalent mods, um, which means it's not above power. Which means that because everything before it was, or everything before it was so weak, you're not going to want to have wasted the time to get there, because this one mod won't carry you, and the mod package that you'll have got up to this point isn't really enough to be effective either. Um, so I find that most people will largely just skip cloaking implants and go for secret tech options, which is a pretty common theme for the assembly mods. Um, often people will want to go secret tech, um, because the units are not awful. They just don't have the, su like each unit on paper seems pretty okay. They just don't have the package around to support them. So if you go with secret tech mods that fit, um, it helps a lot, and it really op it opens up a little more to be exploring around with what assembly has for you. Um, moving on up, toxin nanites ammunition. Um, this mod is a single unit only mod. I talked. I don't remember how much I've talked about single unit mods before, but as a general statement, in my opinion. Single unit mods are, with very few exceptions, awful. Um, it's just not enough value to go deep down the tech tree for a mod that only works for one unit. This one's an especially bad example because not only is it one unit, it's one unit that is a tier 7 tech <laughs> on the other tree. So you have to get a tier 5 tech and a tier 7 tech before you can put this mod in anything. And even once you put it on, um, I think the only difference is that you flip from that 15 damage over time physical to 15 bio damage. Really all you've added is debilitating infection. Which, yeah, that's... I gotta close this. F1, debilitating... Debilitating infection. It's minus morale and 20% easier to hit. I mean, that's not. I mean, obviously, it's a debuff. It's not good for you, but that's not good enough to carry this mod. Um, and you can get 20% damage mods in a million other different ways. So, even if this wasn't a single unit only mod, it would be bad. But because it's a single unit only mod, it's just like super bad. Um. And not worth your time. No toxic implants is. What does neural toxin do? All these exciting mods I've never looked at. Oh, all these. Is, I've looked at the mods, but I've never had to fight against them. Ooh, focus on that. That is powerful. Oh, that's right. That's that got changed, didn't it? That used to be something else. Neural toxin is was added in one of the DLCs. Um, so that's way better. Um, it gives you a s it gives you an ability that can stun people for three turns. That's strong. Um, it's not again. It's not strictly a single unit only mod. It's not. 
It's more restrictive than just melee, because it's only on assembly units, but it's pretty much um, melee. Yeah, it'd be good if you ever could put it on like a wrecker. I don't know. For the same reasons you don't put flesh chairs on uh, on scabs, I don't think you doubly don't put this on because it's twice as expensive. Um, it's just fits in that weird window of it's really hard to justify putting offensive mods on melee units. I think the wrecker you could because the wrecker is just so tanky with no support whatsoever. But again, that means you had a tier 6 and a tier 5 tech for a mod on one of your units. That's not enough value. You really want mods that you can put on everything um, as much as you can. Um, at tier 7 here, you get the assembly module, which this is a strong mod. Um, I mean, this is really late for a regeneration mod. But it's a plus 15 health, which is great. Um, and the being able to clear with impunity is super great. Now, this is very late for that to have too much effect. But if you're somehow in a game with assembly and you haven't died, um, and you can get reassembly out on a stack of something, um, you can just start knocking over landmarks whatever you want and not worry about losing anything as long as you're strong enough to win the fight which should be pretty easy um you can just go nuts so reassembly again it's a good mod comes really late um but it is one of the tar like one of the targets that you can go for as assembly again issue being that much of the stuff on the way to it is just not great so you're you're going through a lot of trash before you find the treasure here. Um, advanced re-engineering, single unit only mod, which means I am extremely skeptical of it, and this is not powerful enough to change that opinion. Um, the reassemble heavy units, basically that would mean that you can now reassemble your records, but you're not going to be getting records and this mod in most multiplayer games, that's just too too far to go. Um, so the heavy unit part of this doesn't matter so much. Going to advanced constructs is good. I mean, it does take the construct from being like a tier 0.5 <laughs> up to a tier 1 unit, at least scout level, but uh, that's not enough value um, to be worth a whole mod of its own. You'll never see anybody use this in multiplayer. Um, finally, at the end here, we have two very cool mods. Um, quad Emergency Quantric Shielding uh, basically keeps you up for one turn when you were supposed to die, which is cool. Um, very powerful. Borderline broken, but it's also a tier 9 tech. So if the assembly player got to this and was able to spend the Cosmite to put it on things, I mean, he deserves to win. Um, this is one of the strongest mods in the game, I think. Um, Quantum Support Nanites is not quite as good. Um, it's not bad, but restricted to heavy units only is painful. And it's... I mean, it's basically giving you Swarm Shields and 10 heal. Well, 10 heal per turn. Which, just play Kyoko. <laughs> and then you have Swarm Shields and you can put Regen on instead. It's much cheaper. Um, this is not nearly as good as, as Quantic, Quantic Shielding. Um, I, if you ever got this far, I can't imagine what you would put this on or why you would put it on there. I just think there's a lot more cost effective choices. You're not teching, you're not getting this far to tech to this. What you want is this quantic shielding. That's what's gonna win it, win it for you. Um, so those are the mods. Uh, we will switch to the ops, and I'll just go down the other way here. Temporal disruption. Um, disable one mod and all all enemy units for two turns. That is pretty damn powerful. Um, 
it's very, it's certainly disruptive, um, as you might think. The trick here is that you don't know which mods you're going to disable. Um, and y you're still in the same issue of you went pretty far down the tree to get to this level. Um, I think if you get this far, you will use this operation um, in, in any big 18 versus 18 fights. Um, this is one of those operations that scales better the more units there are in the fight as opposed to scaling worse. So if you're in, in a three stack versus a three stack, I mean, you've disabled 18 mods with this if you use it right away, which even if you're not always hitting the best mod of your opponent, that's a pretty significant power advantage in your favor um, to, to push this out. So y you're not going to text strictly to get this, but if you're on the path for reassembly, you'll be glad to have this. <coughs> Adhesive artillery, uh, I think, got nerfed at some point, but... Uh, I've been screwed by this more than once. Um, this is w a very great tool against melee um, opponents. Uh, being able to slow. It's oh, the slow is on the physical channel. Okay, that might have used to be the bio channel, but it's one of the. It's an operation that gives you um, some cross channel damage, which is situationally okay but really the advantage here is you can slow a large hex aoe um which like i said really screws melee doesn't really help against a lot of other people it's cheap though four operation points for two hex aoe is, is strong um let's do linear accelerator first uh three operation points to restore the action points of a unit is definitely worth it. Um, you have to be smart in your fight on what you use this on, but this could easily kill one. It, it, you're definitely going to want to use this to kill at least one other unit. Um, and probably trying to use this in order to kill like two or three other units um, depending on how your stuff is structured but uh, this is very powerful at at the level of tier it's coming in on um, the assembly operations aren't bad um, they tend to be kind of these I don't want to say niche cases um, they're they're weird to use sometimes um, going back to that unorthodox answers, but uh, they are very powerful within their um, realm of use. Deploy Constrictor, all right, let me, so first we'll just say that the con that the op itself doesn't do anything other than summon the Constrictor, but let's look at the Constrictor. Um, it is a, I mean, it says it's a T2, it's a little better than that because it's got a lot higher defense stats than your T2 normally would have. Uh, when it comes on the battlefield, you can immediately project Constriction Field, which disables a unit while the Constrictor is on it, and it makes the Constrictor super tanky. That is interesting, um, but you're spending three operation points, and whereas for Linear Accelerator, you're killing something. For Constrictor, you're locking something down if... There's no check for this. I think... I've had this happen to me a couple times. Like, people have used this operation against me. There is a hidden check here to break the Constriction. I don't know what it is. Um, I think... Like, this is an extremely... From being on the other side of this, having it be used on me, it's extremely annoying. Um, very... I mean, an annoyance level, it feels very powerful. Um, I have talked... Having talked to the people using it on the other side, they didn't seem to think it was doing a whole lot. But uh, I felt that it was strong. Um, so, 
if you are an assembly main, keep with it, because <laughs> people will hate you for using constrictors on the battlefield. Um, both of these ops are good. I think linear accelerator, it really just depends on what it is you need to have happen. Um, constrictor is probably a little better later in the fight, because it's less likely that the opponent will want to use actions. Whereas early in the fight, you'd rather, instead of soft locking something down that they can release again, you just want it to die, so you want to use linear accelerator. But I think both of these are situationally very useful. Um, remote system purge is just great. Um, two operation points for a jumping cleanse uh, is pretty phenomenal. Um, cleanses are rare enough in the game, and status effects are powerful enough that you really like having some available. It's not the best cleanse in the game, um, but considering that not everyone has access to one at all, you're happy to have one as assembly. Uh, the final tactical operation is uh, signal shredding. Um, signal shredding is even a little more situational, I think, than some of the other operations um, because it's targeted mechanical cyborg only. However, that's a very high chance to stun and worst case, your massive impact. It's super cheap, 25 energy and one op point, so you're perfectly willing to spam it out on the big targets. Um, as with the other ones that I've talked about here, filling, kind of fitting this pattern of within the realm of, oh, this op is useful, it's very useful, but there's a lot of cases where it's totally not useful and you wouldn't have needed it. Um, <coughs> it's certainly not powerful enough to super, like, drive getting this tier 1 tech for it. Um, but if you have it for some other reason, you'll be pulling it out in fights occasionally. <sighs> for strategic ops, we have Reprocess Colonist. Um, this is one... This is probably the main one where I don't have a good handle on where I think this fits. Because since I'm not playing as the assembly player, <laughs> I don't know how much they use it. Um, one population for a 50% production increase is an okay emergency button. But there's better emergency buttons out there than that. I doubt this is awesome, but I'm willing to be proven wrong if if anybody knows better than me on this one. Um, sample collection is a it's an army army nuke. Um, I think eight op points seems expensive for an army nuke, but I no that seems no oh, no that's your day vulnerability. Yeah, it is a little expensive, but in principle you're getting tech out of it. Um, it reduces resistances. It seems fine. Um, the army nukes really depend on your um, game settings, and specifically, are you in live versus or simultaneous turns versus um, classic turns? Classic turns, this, the army nukes are a lot better because you can guarantee that you get your nukes off, and then you can engage the opponent before they can counter nuke you or heal anything. In simultaneous turns, depending on your gentleman or gentle ladies agreements. Um, y the way I play, people will pretty much agree that if one person gets the chance to dump all this stuff, the other person should too. So, the, the single target nu or the army nukes get less value because it's not coming out of the blue. Um, whereas in classic tones, they're very good. So, short answer is yeah, sample collection is fine. Um, I'm not sure if the package here of Reprocess Colonists and Sample Collection is good enough to justify taking the tech, but that's, again, I think here, this tech specifically is one that, uh, if I played more Assembly, I'd have a better answer for that. I could see an argument going either way, and I just don't have the, the, post, the first hand experience to know if people take this tech or not. Um, going down the line here for ionic manipulation, I can tell you they don't take this one, and that's just because it takes so damn long to get to. Um, ion storm... Uh, if I remember right, that's a map. I can look it up. Oh, 
wrong button. F1, not escape. Ion storm. Um, yeah, it's a sector hazard, which not every race has access to generating a sector hazard. In general, that's not a very strong thing to have access to. Um, and it's coming so late in the tech tree that by the time you get it, your opponent can just cleanse it right away. So you're not... You know, you've got better things to spend 60 knot points on, almost certainly. Um, Ionic Overdrive, on the other hand, fast movement speed, melee attack, stun targets, and deal extra damage. It's an interesting package. Um... Hold on. Scavs on. Scavs are already fast movement, though. Oh, is that. Fast movement's not actually a thing. What? Fast. Yeah, so it's not. You're not gaining anything for scavs, so this is like wreckers only. Except you get the melee attack stun, which looks like it's a guaranteed. I mean, again, obviously I've never seen this be used on me. Um, it's just too late. A 2-6 a two tech that you got to get all these kind of crappy mods. You're not going to see it in practice. But if someone's doing something cool with... Oh, it's Cyborg 2. Ugh. Which means you can't use it with, like, Xeno Plague or anything. Man. Yeah, this is bad. You're never going to see this. Um, and super duper late game if you have some crazy record stacks and then you're just teching into stuff for fun because you think you've already won. Then this is when this gets pulled out. But uh, I don't think this is going to be a competitive thing in 1v1s or even 2v2s. I just don't think there's enough time for it to come online. Um... And that's it for the strategic ops. Let's talk doctrines. Um, Battlefield autopsies, again, I said I think this is very strong. Um, it doesn't look like much, and even if you do the math, it doesn't sound like a whole lot. Um, if you assume that you get a standard clear every turn, um, let's just pick this as an example. You've got two two ones and two two twos, so uh, three tech each is three six plus 2 times 3 is 6 is 12, plus another 6 is 18. So that's not quite your initial income. But on turn 1, um, if you get it up turn 1, you wouldn't. But um, with your standard default income, you're somewhere around a 70% increase, which is significant. I mean, it takes this tech from four turns to probably two and change, maybe three turns, and then the next one is a turn quicker. So it really adds up because on the econ side, on the econ tree here, um, the faster you can go, the faster you can get your development and then be rolling into the rest of your economy. So as I said, with some of the other races, you get food, which helps you build your pop. Going for research in theory means that you are getting your development text faster and then you can push that back into your economy and then it feeds back on itself and you're still just as kickstarted as everyone else. Um, that works, but A, you need to be a pretty good player and B, you need to have a decent map. S like, you need to have started in a decent place on the map or you need to be a really great player. <laughs> And, and never screw up any of your sector expansions or anything. So, um, going back to Battlefield Autopsies, that 3-tech per tier of unit killed is significant. Um, it's, it is helpful, period. Um, in the hands of a great player, I think Battlefield, Aut Battlefield Autopsies might be the best doctrine in the game. Um, well, best racial doctrine. I still think Economist is probably the best, but um, Battlefield Autopsies is, is solid. It's very solid. Um, one of, if not the best racial doctrine in the game. Um, that being said, Scavengers is not terrible either. 
it doesn't have the numbers listed. I know those numbers have been changed. I haven't talked too much with my assembly buddies um, on how it feels now, but uh, last I knew, Scavengers was still, like, powerful. Um, I don't think... I mean, it's not broken. I think it was broken, as in, like, literally something with it was wrong, and it was way too good. But um, I believe this is still worth taking... I don't think it's worth taking over Battlefield Autopsies yet. I probably don't think it's worth taking as your second doctrine. You probably have a better choice by the time the second doctrine unlocks. So that's that's the main issue with get with scavengers is I think it kind of fits in a window of you don't really get a doctrine slot for it in time for it to be helpful. Um, there's always something that's a little bit better for you. I'm gonna take a quick break here to take a drink. And we could talk about connected society. Um, so there's two things going on here. One is that the two of five doctrines are in a terrible place because they're stuck behind dawn of a new union. Um, none of this stuff matters at all in multiplayer. The only one that comes close is hero resurrection protocol. But if you've lost a hero, that either means you're pretty bad and you screwed up um, in your clearing phase, or you've already lost. Oh, one, the first big fight, um, which is probably already decided the game, more likely than not. So, y you're not getting much use out of Hero Resurrection Protocol in most multiplayer games. Oh, well, 1v1s, anyways. Again, different different strokes for uh, different game settings, but none of this is super useful, which means that these this tier 5 tech is really a tier 5 plus a tier 4 tech for these, and none of the doctrines are ever good enough to justify that much investment. You're just going to skip it. If you feel like doctrines, you're going to skip it and go towards a tier 7 or beyond. But anyways, as far as my opinion, strictly for what Connected Society offers you, um, it's good. All colonists getting plus one tech. It's a little late for that to be super helpful, but um, that, assuming you have, let's say, four cities and averaging 8 pops per city. Oh, that's only 32. Hmm. That's not a ton, ton. But for a doctrine slot, that's not awful. The full happiness, I'm largely discounting. Because for the most part, you probably will have happiness well settled. You're going to be getting less happiness events, though. Yeah. This is like a super late game doctrine because you really want to be getting more value out of it than just four cities at eight pops per city. You probably want to be getting at least 40 pops worth, which is, is hard to have happen in, the, in a 1v1 format. So even if it wasn't sitting at this tier 5, I don't think people would use it. I think there's better choices. Now... That would depend. If you are strictly just purely optimizing research, you would take this. If you're, you know, research at the cost of all else. But if you're being a little more well-rounded, there's better choices. No interfacing data core. Eh. It really depends on the map. I, I don't pay attention enough to what's specifically a ruined sector to know how much value you'd expect to get out of this. Um... If you would have one ruined sector per city, this is pretty much just... Oh, it's a colony upgrade. That's a building. Ugh. That's bad. Well, you're not giving up a docking slot. It In the right city, but again, I don't know how many cities have ruined sectors. That's not something I've ever had reason to pay attention to. Um, So they just have one less doctrine. Okay, cool. Uh, this is not the racials. This is the racials. Great harvest. This is bad. By the time this is unlocked, I mean, you never see two nine doctrines anyways, but even if you did, by the time you, this is unlocked, food and production are the last things you want um, in the late game. I mean, production's okay, but uh, food is not helpful. 
uh, yeah. And even then, the production, I don't think this is worth the slot. There's probably some better choice to be putting in there. Recycle of life, you get a bunch of morale, which means that you're getting a little extra damage across the board, and a bunch of energy, but only when you lose a friendly unit. I wonder how that interacts with um, the resurrection mod. I don't know. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever bothered to test that, like in a multiplayer setting. So there's probably some single player guy who plays 200 tone games that would know the answer to that, but I don't. If it if it does interact that you can have units die, but then they resurrect and you still get the energy, that's not bad. But uh, I feel like in single player you're really not expecting to lose that many units to begin with, and this would not be great. And in multiplayer, you're not losing units fast enough for that to be helpful. And the 400 morale by itself is okay. But you have better choices, I think. So I don't really like either one of those mods, or uh, doctrines, um, especially as tier 9 doctrines. I just don't think they're impactful enough. Um, if you're going for this, it's really just for the extra doctrine slot, and you'll probably want one of your earlier choices. Um, so it's a mixed bag for the doctrines, really, though. The ones that matter are the, the tier 1s. Um, none of the rest you're going to see in multiplayer um, in, in the faster formats anyhow. So as far as the tier 1 goes, tier 1 doctrines go, very solid. Again, one of, if not the best in the game, plus a very good one, um, even if you might not see it just because of its competition. Um, let's quickly go through the secret tech variants just to say what they are. Um, I, assembly Lightbringer, I think, just has Assimilate, and again, the, the scavenge get spare parts is a racial ability, um, so all of the secret tech, assembly secret tech, um, units have, um, arc resistance, they're tagged as a cyborg, and, and scavenge spare parts, um, except I think for the strictly mechanical ones, I can actually check that. Um, but before we check that, um, yeah, that's the only difference is, um, not Frenzy, wrong unit, assembly, is uh, Assimilate, which is okay. I mean, that's just good on a melee unit. Um, the Star Guide is nothing. It's just, again, the asse general assembly package. Um, let's look at, uh, let's skip to Promethean because they want to check on the mechanical one. The assembly purifier has, I believe, nothing. I believe it's just default. It looks default. Yeah. The Vow Purifier is entrenched. The uh, Assembly Purifier doesn't have anything. And yeah, the Aegis Tank is just one Aegis Tank for everybody, so the mechanical units stay mechanical. That'd be interesting if they ever changed that um, to give Assembly uh, Cyborg variants of the mechanical units. That'd be cool. Might happen. So the thing that Triumph would, would do out of nowhere. Um... Psi number, the assembly initiate, uh, and the um, elector both have this reconstruct the soul. So when the assembly initiate dies, uh, you get a free echo of despair, which is actually quite powerful. Um, but uh, again, I'll talk about echoes when and if I talk about psi number someday. Um, that's the only difference is that reconstruct the, s the soul. And again, just to prove it, yep, same thing for the assembly elector and no other changes from the rest. The synthesis, the hacker for the assembly, um, has uh, a different variant of the daemon. Instead of the haywire daemon, they have the reconstructed daemon, um, which this is a summon for a weak unit, um, as opposed to being a disable. That is probably a net buff probably um because the reconstructed daemon is decently tanky 25 1 and 1 is not great but that's about a scout stat um it's got about it's basically like summoning a weak scout in combat um which is better than not being able to do it so 
um, that I find that this disabled really depends on what you're fighting, obviously. Um, and it's a sing it's a once per battle strength eight only, so that's a pretty high low roll. Whereas reconstructed daemon, yes, it's a full action, but it is at range seven, not a touch range, and uh, you're guaranteed to get value out of it. So yeah, that's definitely a net buff over the the standard variant. Void tech. Uh, the assembly echo walker also just has assimilate, um, and no other change. To my knowledge. Yeah. No other change. <coughs> then Xenoplague and Heritor don't have variant units. So that's it as far as the secret tech variants go. And that's it as far as uh the bit by bit discussion, and we can transition into talking about builds. So um I booted up here as assembly synthesis, but the first build I want to talk about is kind of just a a pure assembly build, uh, ignoring the secret tech entirely. Um, and just kind of as a generic default, what you could always do. And to maybe no surprise, if you've listened through the whole video, um, this default build is leveraging the strength of the firearms tree, and the strengths of your kind of two best early units, which are the scavengers and the verbal snipers. So the idea behind this build is really to to go as simple as you can with that tactical game plan of your scavengers are going to be screening for your vocal snipers. Um, your vocal snipers are going to be your primary killers. They're also going to be able to do a lot of uh, crowd control and debuffing stuff. Um, from that sniper range backline, um, while your scavengers kind of just muck up stuff. That's not the one I wanted. Just kind of muck up stuff in front to to keep your vocals up. So, um, primarily the advantage of this is a very simple tech path. Um, debatably, it's two techs. <laughs> um, you all you really are aiming for is rail accelerators uh, to throw on your vocal snipers. You don't mind getting flechettes and or electrified, well, not and or, but either flechettes or electrified as well um, for just a little bit extra damage. But for this bare minimum, you just want that extra range. Accuracy is okay too. Um, from there, your options are as open as they get for assembly. Um, really, your debate past that point is do you think you need most survivability for your um, scavengers uh, to try to lightly mod them or do you want even more damage for your vocal snipers your better answer is probably more damage um, you could quick swing by ocular implants just because it's going to be a very cheap tech by that point and for five Cosmite, you're going to be able to get a little bit of a health. Like, you can put this on literally all those units, Scavengers and Vopals, and it's going to help at least a little bit. Um, it's it's a good kind of just filler mod to throw on, and then you can always replace it later. Um, if you do go for more damage, um, Kinetic Phase Modulator is a pretty hefty upgrade um, for just one more tech down the Firearms Tree. Um, you it is a 20% increased damage mod, um, so that is not as significant. But the ignoring accuracy penalties from line of sight um, is great because hopefully for your vocals there's always going to be something in between you and the opponent. That's what you want. Um, and bypassing three shields can be extremely helpful as well. Um, from there. Traditionally, the answer was to go Fire Burst way back in the day. Um, that was when Fire Burst uh, not only dealt damage to adjacent units, but it also transferred status effects. Um, at that time, that meant that when you did a concussive shot, you actually were doing AoE concuss that you could ground target instead of unit target, um, which meant that even if someone was you know, in defense mode behind a wall, you could just target the ground next to them, and you'd still have like an 80% chance to land or something dumb like that. Um, it was really broken, so that's been changed. It still is probably worth it to try to go all the way up to Fire Burst, um, because doing 
turning your snipers into a one hex AOE that does nearly full damage um, at what's going to be 10 range, that's pretty nutty. Um, the burning is... sure. Um, at 12 strength, it's almost certainly going to go off. That's for increasing your accuracy, doing a little bit of damage over time. It's totally viable to do nothing in this build, <laughs> but go straight down the firearms tree, maybe with one jump into molecular computing. Now, in practice, you're also probably going to have some secret tech mod that you're going to want early on, but uh, you could try to just get all the way down to Shockwave Confuser, um, although that's slightly less useful on vocals because you already have a way to concuss so maybe you just get to fire burst and call it good and then you start looking for some other broken thing to be using um, but that kind of is the I think the very most basic core build to to go with for assembly um, and obviously you're not skipping out and building some scouts and whatnot but uh, you can really narrow down your, your tech path if you want to with these guys but again even for this you're you're looking at your code text is only two paths, but to start getting more mods, you're looking at T5 or even a T7 um, tech before you can start substantially upgrading what it is you're doing. So and so that really kind of goes to again, you're planning for more late game, you're really leaning on tech, and you don't have a lot of flexibility because d it depends on what your secret tech is, but um, you're not going to get a lot of value from this build out of your early assembly stuff. Like, it's just not giving you too much. So, always keep that in mind. Um, and that build, so, looking at the strengths and weaknesses, what are you trying to do? That build is really more so export your strengths, right? F you have the firearms tree, you want to use it. You have long range, you want to use it. Um, you're not fixing too many of your issues, right? You still only have armor for defense. Um, the way I guess you're fixing your racial mods by just not using them. So, uh, yeah, your start's not going to be all that fast, even though your core, your build's going to be up online pretty quick. Um, you're still stuck with the same starting units as you would have otherwise, so you're still going to be trying to expand with largely scavs, um, which you're going to have mixed results with. Um... The second build I wanted to talk about is uh, Assembly Synthesis. Um, this build is a little more geared now from just strictly exploring strengths. Now we're going to take that same kind of core build and also mitigate our weaknesses, right? So um, why Synthesis? Well, Synthesis has kind of exactly the things we want. It's got really solid early mods. Um, you're not super fixing your issue as far as um, mostly armor for defense. Now, you are getting access to a couple operations that help with that. Um, both of these, either you just give yourself two shields for all your modded units, or you can just heal out of it instead. Um, so you're not totally fixing it as far as like your mods aren't going to directly do it, but you're giving yourself at least some flexibility um, for shield defense. Um, more importantly though, you are getting like an evasion mod that's giving you another defensive stat. It's just way better than ocular implants is as a cheap way to buff the effectiveness of your scavs at their job. Um, targeting Damon Shell is a easy, like cheap third mod to toss on your uh, vocal snipers. Accuracy and crit chance plus integrated is kind of a nice, well-rounded boost um, to to what th the things you want with your vocals, right? You already have a crit chance, so adding more is only you're adding to a strength, which is usually good. Accuracy on snipers is always good. Um, so with just this one tech, you've gone a long way. Once you toss in combat subroutines, you've also mitigated a lot of your weaknesses. Um, the other thing you have available to you now is you open up hackers which they have that we constructed daemon um they can kind of serve as a midline where you don't just have that very front line screen and then a bunch of empty space and then snipers in the back now you can toss hackers in the middle
They bring their own frontline screeners with this daemons that you can also throw into the front line to keep the opponents further away for as long as possible. Um, and they just deal a bunch of damage. Now, they are on the arc, ch arc channel, which you have the arc weapons line. You could cheaply get static build up. Um, you could even try to go electron impact um, for arc retaliation on stuff. I think classically the way that you would do this is you're still going to want probably to go synthesis integration into the two fire into these two text for rail accelerators then combat subroutines because that's around the time you're going to be probably fighting um, that's for the non-hacker variant I think for the hacker variant you probably do information could excuse me you do synthesis integration information control up for rail accelerators and then combat subroutines um, is probably your first five techs for uh, assembly synthesis in the most kind of classic variant of it. Um, and then from there you can decide if you want to get some value mods in the arc line, if you want to just try to go deep and, and get total network integration, or if you want to go deeper in your firearms line. Yeah, it's the downside of this from the first build is it's obviously more tech. We've added three more whole new techs before you get your co online. But Instead of just solely doubling down on your strengths, you, you're adding a bunch of tools to try to help with your weaknesses. Um, even to an extent, just that very slow start in that these, the synthesis mods come online very quickly. Because you assembly, you're comfortable modding very early. Um, and these mods are just good enough that you're comfortable having them and then never changing off of them. Um, Gaudian Damon Shell is told like it's a huge force multiplier for your more melee units. Um, in most, not all, but in most, um, <coughs> Marauder clears. And targeting Damon Shell is also just solid to put on, on your Bopal Snipers. Um, the only difficulty here is you are, if you go with the hacker variant, um, you have to balance between building support or uh, specialist units and skirmisher units. You need to build both. Whereas if you skip the hackers and just basically go with that same basic game plan of scavengers and um, focal snipers, plus now some good assembly or good synthesis mods, um, you never have to worry about building skirmisher barracks. You can always just be specialist barracks only. So um, there's flexibility here. Um, but the flexibility is really, you want to know what it, which way you're going ahead of time because once you start locking in, it's going to be really hard um, to change that. So, especially here with the, the hacker ones of, you typically want to get your units that you want, that you're going to be building first and then the mods because you can always mod the units in the field. You can't, you know, build the mods and then have the units come later. So, in this sort of build, if you need to know immediately if you want hackers or not, because that's going to be your second tech, almost certainly. Um, let's close this out, and then let's talk about uh, a slightly different approach. Uh, no, I don't need to save that game. <coughs> let's talk about assembly Xenoplague. So... What would you be trying to do with Assembly Xenoplague, and why would you be trying to do that? Xenoplague, traditionally, is a secret tech that is extremely front-loaded to rushing. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that that I will probably talk about in a different video. Um, for our purposes today, um, it's mostly just that you're going to be getting free units early on. Um, so long as you're winning... Um, and getting some and getting your inflicts consistently, uh, you will be getting free spawn units. And free spawn units are basically the the engine of expanding quickly and and rushing your opponent. Um, people aren't expecting that out of assembly. Um, and there are some other kind of little hidden um, 
hidden tie-ins here uh, that you might not otherwise look at. So the two I want to look at are um, Xenoplague Parasite and Flesh Terror. So Oh, wait, crap. Did I screw this up? I might have screwed this up. Postural. Is this an animal? Oh, good, it is. <laughs> I was scared for a second that I was wrong. Um, you can put flesh terror implants on postules. And postules that can self-heal are terrifying. Um, because I shouldn't have... I should have looked at this version of the postule on here. Um... Because Pustules have Skitter and decent, pretty good uh, tier 1 stats at 40 hit points. Uh, well, no, that's just average, right? That's the same as the, uh... Yeah, there's, they're evasive-based defense as opposed to uh, other stats. So, because a lot of people don't play melee, um, if you go Pustules, and if for some reason your opponent is not air, like, that's the big vulnerability here is air units. But if they're not air units... Um, your postures are largely gonna be fine uh, to defend themselves. You don't have to worry about modding them quite as much as some other melee units. Um, the only exception would be if you're fighting melee units. But um, the might take damage on the way in, but it won't be a lot. And being able to self heal is going to really up their survivability. Um, more so than just giving them some more uh, defensive stats. Um, again, just because they're so hard to hit in the first place. So, if you... Like, Flesh Terror implants are a very attractive mod to put on Pustules. And Xenoplague Parasite, conversely, um, is a decently attractive mod to put on anything um, assembly. Because... It's a plus HP mod that comes online very early, and assembly just have a lot of ways to heal, right? Um, and they have a lot of ways to resurrect units. So, th so this is one where you might actually think about reverse engineers. But even aside from that, um, miniaturized corpse processor is an easy way um, to utilize that extra health that you have. You're doubling down in your status resists, um, and if you do get later, um, you can start exploring stuff like cloaking implants. Um, you can't do neurotoxin, because again, that's restricted to assembly units only for some reason. But if you really get crazy, you can get down to your assembly. Hopefully you'll have one before then, though. Really, the, the point of this, I think, is you're going to want... You're going to attack into flesh chairs. Uh, well, no, you're not. You're going to attack into dispersion first, because you want... Because you want as many ways to... Um, infect things as possible, and then you're going to go for flesh terrors. And you're going to hope that by the time you get these techs in, um, all your stuff is oriented towards a very melee build. You're basically going to do nothing but build scavengers, um, and you're actually going to mod them more than you probably would otherwise. Um, you're going to put on Xenoplague Parasites and probably something like Xenografted Muscles. Um, just to increase your odds of um, of infection, and then with all the pustules you're gonna get, you're gonna be tacking on flesh terrors and just all these generically okay mods um, that uh, will let you keep everything up. Um, your vulnerability here again, as I said before, is going to be flyers. Um, if your opponent is going heavy into those, you're, you're going to lose because all you have are shotguns to fight against it. But against pretty much anything else, um, you're going to be coming online way faster than anybody expects assembly to do. Um, I had to fight against this. It was interesting. Um, I think I still won. It was close. I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> um, but... Uh, it's it's a very different way to play assembly um, from what you would normally do because uh, normally you're spending your early game just hoping that your opponent doesn't come at you. Whereas in this version, your your goal is to be at the opponent probably by turn 15 to 20, and um, 
you may, you're not even going to slow down to wait for flesh terrors. You're you're going to be hoping to get flesh terrors, but if you don't, you're going to deal with what it is you've got. So, um, you, as far as strengths and weaknesses go, again, it's this is a totally different. You're not really going with the strengths of assembly here. You're going with the strengths of Xenoplague a little more, but um, you're doing it so that you can flip that weakness of early game. Um, and to a large point, um, with many of the builds that I didn't talk about too much with assembly, a lot of them really lean more into the secret tech side than the, the racial side. Um, just because, again, this whole early package of their mods and their units, none of it really fits together all that well um, to work out like as a coherent build. So often you're just kind of really skipping all the assembly stuff and you're going to be driving down your secret techs but if you're doing that anyways then you're not going to be building a lot of assembly stuff and that's really not the point of the deep dive to talk about not being assembly so um i did want to bring again this one i just thought was a cool one um that i had a fight against um that uh i do think has potential um it just has that one crippling weakness <laughs> uh but in any other situation it's how to address uh Xenoplay, but that applies to pretty much anybody. Uh, Assembly does have some interesting tools to combine with Xenoplay, though. Um, not everybody has mods that really fit well onto Pustules or Destroyers, and uh, Assembly does. So, with that, I think that's the Assembly video um, down the pipe and, and done. Um, I got some pretty good feedback on the previous one. I enjoyed it. Um, thank you. Anybody else that has comments, always please leave them, and I'll address them as best I can. Um, I'm not sure who I'll do next. I don't have a real pattern for these. Um, I'm not going in strength order or alphabetical or anything. I'm just kind of doing it as, as they attract me, so we'll see who I decide. I'm not quite sure yet. Um, and I guess, yeah, with that... Thanks for listening, and uh, enjoy Planetfall.